Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Tuesdays with Corey. Brought to you by the Long-Term Care Planning Group. Now here's your host, Corey Rick. Thank you very much. Corey Rick here on another episode of Tuesdays with Corey. Uh, Mr. Stone Payton, uh, our producer. Great to see you today, Stone. Hey, what a delight, man. This is so much fun. This is our first Tuesdays with Corey broadcasting from the Sandy Springs Innovation Center. We've moved. We've got different digs. I'm kind of liking it, though. What do you think? Uh, it's outstanding. I mean, the Today Show doesn't have anything on you. <laughs> That's right. you got all this glass. And today's episode is brought to you in part by ARC, American Reprographics Corporation. If you print with it, print on it, or simply want it printed, head on over to arcinatlanta.com. Or better yet, reach out and ask to speak with Mindy Godwin. You can reach her directly at 770-394-2465. Corey, who we got with us today, man? We've got another great guest today, Stone. Uh, Cherish Delacruz is the founding partner of Delacruz Law. Delacruz Law is a life and estate planning firm specializing in new and growing families, small businesses, and elder law. They understand that caring for your loved one isn't something you just do today. It's something that you choose to do every day. That's why they believe in education, and they're educating their clients through a state planning process so they can truly understand and take charge of their lives and legacy. In working with her firm, you will no doubt find confidence and peace of mind that she is doing all she can do to help you and put your family in the best position possible. She understands that caring for your loved ones and planning isn't something you just do today. Um, and additionally, she is actively involved in the community, serving on several boards throughout greater Atlanta. She dedicates her time to serving and educating small businesses, families, and the larger community about a state and business planning process so that they can truly take charge of their lives and legacy and trust in their abilities to care for their loved ones. Cherish, welcome. Good morning. It's great to have you on the show today. We appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Um, why don't you introduce yourself further to the listenership here at Business Radio X and Tuesdays with Corey? Sure. Um, thank you, Corey, for having me. And um, I love the Space Stone. It's, it's fabulous. Um, so a little bit about myself. I am a mother of three. Um, I have aging baby boomer parents. I grew up in Toronto and I specialize in business succession planning for small businesses and also estate planning. How did you come into that? Uh, what was the reason uh, going to law school? And I know you went to a great law school. We'll yes. come back to that. Go Hawkeyes. How did you, <laughs> how did you decide to focus on estate planning? Um, like many things in my life, um, it was not planned. Um, I think, you know. So it found you. It found me. And in my life, I've been blessed enough to have what I would call God winks. Um, experiences that, you know, have taken me here to the place where I am right now. Um, but my aunt, who was like my second mother, um, she got diagnosed with cancer, a rare form of cancer, appendix cancer, when she was 51 years old. Sorry to hear that. And I was working in-house um, at Primerica, and um, it's a investment and insurance firm. And so when that happened, um, I was devastated. Nobody in my family had ever mm -hmm. experienced cancer. We didn't have that in our family. And that experience in, in helping her with that process um, prompted me to go into estate planning. The attorney that I was working with, although he was great and he was nice, he was a general practitioner, but he didn't do any detailed planning and didn't really ask the questions that he needed to ask. Um, and so that's what made me go into estate planning. And I think that experience helps me and shapes my interactions with my clients. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, experience can be a very, very powerful teacher. Um, what I heard from there, uh, one of the things that I think is important uh, to consider is to engage the services of a specialist. And it's difficult to ask somebody that doesn't do something every day to do something that requires a high level of intricacy at a high level. Would you agree? Yes, I agree. And so this, you know, he, he was, he came from, um, a friend of mine and my aunt lived up in Wisconsin at the time. And, Whereabouts? 
Um, Racine. I know exactly yeah. where it is. <laughs> right. It, it's, it, it's, you know, to sleep a little, well, not sleepy, but it's just smaller town than Atlanta. Um, and then, you know, smaller than Toronto, which is where I grew up. Um, but my aunt lived there, very small community, general practitioner, but he didn't ask the questions and a specialist is important, especially when you have different fi- family dynamics. She was divorced, mm. didn't have any children, um, things that, um, and a, a good estate planner would need to ask. Well, there's a lot of intricacies there. Uh, to do any, to do the work effectively, at least, uh, <clears throat> from my perspective. I mean, you know, and even from what I do, uh, it, it's very important for people to at least ask the questions. Uh, the client may not take the action. Um, but I think it's, these are things that clients aren't going to think about unless somebody is prompting them to think about that. Would you agree? Yes, I, I definitely agree. And so with my clients, and I'm sure with you as well, Corey, it's it's knowing the questions to ask yeah. and then being able to relate to them and, and explain it to the clients in a way that they can understand and that doesn't feel um, invasive or uncomfortable. So with, you know, just in my experience with you, um, making sure that the com- uh, the clients can have hard conversations with you and yeah. with their loved ones. Well, I think, you know, we have uh, something that we try to create at our organization and it's creating this air of consultative engagement. And I think the only way you do that is if you can make people comfortable and you can get them to talk. And uh, if they can say, well, well, Cherish, I don't understand, you know, why this is important to me. I don't understand why this should be important for, you know, to protect my legacy or and just being able to get them to be candid, to ask the questions. And admittedly, you know, what we do is can be awkward. It, oh, it doesn't, ha- it doesn't have to be uncomfortable though. And it is something that the education on either subject is pe- something that people need to at least be aware of so they can make an educated decision. Would, would, does that make sense? Yes. I mean, I think <clears throat> for my clients, um, I want to empower them to make informed decisions. And so I have seen the consequences of not making an informed decision or not making a decision at all. And so what are the consequences? And I like to highlight that with my clients, but through storytelling. It's it's not what we, you know, I could, you know, have a seminar, I could teach all of these things, but unless you can relate it to them <laughs> in a way that they can understand and they can comprehend and they relate to the story that you're telling, whether, you know, whether it's about long-term planning or if, you know, dying without a will or having a plan in place, it's being able to connect with that client to explain it in a way that they can understand and relate to it. And then, you know, having them not feel intimidated about asking a question. Some people, um, and, and some estate planning attorneys, and not all, but, you know, for me, it's important to have that human connection. Yeah. And so having that human connection, because I've gone through those experiences and because I've heard the stories of my clients, helps me able to relate to them better. Um, I feel when I engage with my clients that there's this human component where we start to build a relationship so that when things happen and... um you know, they've lost a loved one or, you know, you know, they've lost a family member or mom or dad, you know, got diagnosed with cancer, that I'll be the first person that they call um, along with the, their relatives, but they, that they can rely on me. It's important for me to have that relationship with them. Well, one thing that, that I have found in my experience with you is that you're relatable. And Thanks. <laughs> I think that uh, your personal experience, good, bad or indifferent, uh, I think can ultimately help others. Uh, if you're willing to share it with them and yes. help them, you know, most people that you're, you know, that you're going to interact with are, are, are fairly intelligent mm-hmm. and very intelligent and don't need to experience the adverse circumstances that you do to learn from it. And right. so I think that's a, from where I sit, uh, I think that that's a tremendous service that you give them is telling them about your experience, telling them what could have been, you know, contemplated or done differently. And then helping them understand what they should do. I, I think that being relatable is right at the top of the list. I think you have to make something that can be cumbersome, awkward, uncomfortable, and you got to break it down into, into pieces so that people can figure out what to do. 
Oh, definitely. I mean, when you're dealing with topics such as disability or death or long-term care or aging parents, nobody, those are hard conversations yeah. to have with anyone. And so, you know, to even <clears throat> start that conversation, um, I've been lucky enough and blessed enough to be able to communicate it to my clients and to other people that I'm educating in a way that is not intimidating. And, you know, it's just, it's lessons learned. It's real life experiences. And I never want my clients to go through things that they don't have to go through, you know, hard times, you know, especially with aging parents. Um, I just wrote this article, um, about how my parents, God love them. Um, but they're in their seventies and we, you know, my sister and I had talked about, you know, having them downsize from their five bedroom, 3,500 square foot house, which was 20 something years old to a smaller home. We knew that my parents were aging, um, yeah. and that we needed to have that hard, difficult conversation. And it wasn't without a lot of emotional ups and downs because my mother, who's, you know, wonderful lady, very independent, fire spirited <clears throat> Filipino woman, want, did refuse to move. She said, I'm going to die in this house. And I said, mom, you know, let's have the conversation. But sometimes when you're trying to have those conversations with your loved ones, it's difficult. And then bring yeah. the, you know, I could explain, you know, financially why that was a good decision, um, uh, you know, all of those things. But until I could speak to her emotions and that she could come to that decision on her own, then we were able to um have that, you know, those hard conversations. And, you know, it involved getting my sister um, involved and having family conversations. So in terms of long-term care and um, aging in place, you know, what are, what are your goals? And I needed to, she needed to express to me that being close to her church was important to her, that having a sense of independence was important to her. And my dad was, you know, my dad's pretty easygoing. Um, but, you know, he wanted a garden or he wanted certain things that I knew that were outlets for him. So, um, thank God they're all moved into their new house, um, which is fantastic. But, you know, it's having those conversations. It's easier said than done. But if you are able to have those difficult conversations with a third party, um, who's been informed of those, um, consequences, then it sometimes it's easier. Well, and obviously you uh, did that out of love and all that. I think, uh, you know, downsizing just from the standpoint of a couple of folks living in a house that size, just the work reduction. Oh, yeah. Moving into a different size home. I, I, I can relate to that because I can remember when, uh, when my dad sold, um, the place that he and mom had lived in for 35 years. Uh, my dad, you know, grew up on a farm and so he never threw anything away. And, you know, we had a pole, <laughs> pole barn behind the house. And I mean, it had like, 1955 Schwinn bikes and right. snowmobiles. And I'm thinking, man, I'm glad he moved to a smaller house right. before, right. You know, before they got ill because it was just such a transition and such a production. And you know, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think they folks get to a point and it's easy to keep going. Um, but I think what isn't always manageable is the work that a big house and all the stuff that goes with it requires. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, and to me, I think is, you know, as I get in, older in my advanced age, I want less drama, not more. And I think that the less things that can affect your day on a daily basis, uh, i.e. a smaller house and, and in fact, probably a newer house for your mm -hmm. parents, you know, the easier things are. Yes, no, definitely. And it's simplifying and, and, and it's having, you know, the conversation with your parents to... um you know, start thinking about that because this was something in progress for probably for the last three or four <clears throat> years. Every year we would have this conversation. We would call it a family meeting. And, uh, you know, and it didn't have to be that formal, but it was just starting planting the seeds for anything in terms of planning. So whether it's long term care planning, yeah. business planning, but planting the seeds and then having starting to have the hard conversations because the last thing that you want to do is be in a situation where you're reacting. Um, and well, you're you, not in a, you're not in a position of strength if you're doing that. Right. Exactly. But this is how a lot of people live and, and that's fine, but you need to try to be proactive because it's less stress. 
I'm, you know, this I, just in. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Plan ahead. Yes. Less plan stress ahead. down the line. People will hear that though. And until they really understand or they know somebody who has gone through that experience, they will not understand themselves. Yeah. So, you know, they have to either experience the heartache through somebody else's story or, you know, be educated on that particular topic. Um, but, you know, it, it's something that planning in general, that people push away because, you know, it's uncomfortable. It, it's not necessarily easy. Um, and, and nobody wants to think about that, you know, because they want to think about funner things. Um, but just knowing the consequences um, it, it's, is important. Well, certainly, you know, asking questions in a way, being relatable, sharing your experience, engaging clients and just helping them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes help means that the client is fully informed and they don't do anything. They don't right. take your advice. But uh, I think at least they know. At right. least uh, they have the education. Definitely. So how does somebody that grew up in Toronto mm -hmm. end up in Atlanta? Well, my mother, um, she, so this was in 93, 94. So I was a... In Canada, we, we didn't use terms like senior, but I was essentially a senior and I was finishing mm. up my last year in, um, high school and, uh, she got a new job down here. Um, my parents were looking to, oh, to live in a warmer place. Like, you know, it, uh, Toronto's extremely they cold. Definitely succeeded yeah, yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> and so, um, my mom found a new job in Atlanta. And so we were going to move all of our entire family there. My sister was in seventh grade. So there's a, there's a five-year gap between us. And so my mom got a new job and we moved down here. And how did you find the transition? It was challenging. Um, how I, so? I grew up in Toronto. Very multicultural, open-minded. Cold. Very cold um, city. But... You know, we were, Toronto is, is, is full of, um, different cultures mm -hmm. and, um, different, you know, religions. And it's a very multicultural society. Atlanta back then was not as diverse as it is now. And so that was a little, it was a huge transition for me. And I grew up in a big city. So I went to UGA for a year. Um, and, you know, Athens at the time wasn't as cosmopolitan as it is now. If mm -hmm. I go to Athens now, I'm like, wow, I'm in this trendy little place. It was not like that yeah. in 1994. <clears throat> so, um, and I know that dates me, but, um, not like Stone and I have been dated, yeah. just for the record. <laughs> but, but thank you for bringing yeah, that yes, up. Yes, yes. So, um, but so it was different and um, it was a little bit of a transition for me. And not that I didn't love going to UGA because it was great. You know, the football was great. Um, I met wonderful friends, my yeah. best friend in Peachtree City. You know, I'm the godmother to her, to um, Henry. And, you know, I made wonderful connections. But I also was dating my now husband at the time and it was a long distance relationship. So I finished up um, university back up in Canada and I came back down here in 1998. And then you went to one of the greatest law schools in the history <laughs> of law schools. Tell yes. us about that. So University of Iowa. So I was in this pre-law program called uh, the Council for Legal Education Opportunity. And it was, um, it was geared towards uh, minority and low income students and helping them make the transition from law school to, um, from undergrad to law school. And, you know, just giving you, um, ideas on what it's like to take uh, a law school exam to prep, to who prep you. And so I did this wonderful program. University of Iowa, um, recruited me. Um, at the program and I ended up going there and, um, they had a great international law program and I thought that's what I wanted to do at the time. And it was the best decision for me at the time. I didn't realize how much I'd love Iowa City or the people that I met there. Um, they were some of the most hardworking, um, very intelligent and just wonderful people. Um, and it was a great law school environment. It was competitive, but not um, 
intimidating. And so the professors were wonderful. So it was one of the best experiences I've had. So you were there 2001 to 2004. So you were there with the year that Brad Banks was runner up in the Heisman Trophy. Yes. Yes. 2002. <laughs> yeah. It, well, I mean, it's, you know, for me, it was idyllic. I, I, it was a great, great experience. <laughs> I was there at a different time than when you were there. Yes. Um, but, uh, so what, you know, when you weren't going to school, what were some of the activities that you like to do there? I am a huge foodie. So I have this ability to find people who are amazing. I'm very blessed in the relationships I have and the people I connect with. One of the ways <clears throat> that I connect with people is through food. And I think that has to do a lot with how I was raised. Family and food were two important things in my life. Um, if you talk to my cousins, everything centered around family. So whether it's at the dinner table and we were eating great food or it was big parties, um, it was all around food. And so I would find this group of people um, and we would cook. We would have like dinners. Um, we would do fam uh, we would do uh, law school dinners and, and plus it was a great stress relief. Um, and we would go out to eat, went out to the bars. So, I mean, it, it was fun. It was a fun time. Oh, they have bars in Iowa City? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and, and, and the great thing about Iowa City, everyone's like, Iowa, there's nothing there. And I'm like, no, it is one of the most cultural cities that, you know, small town, college towns that you will ever go to. Um, very diverse, um, in terms of the experiences that you can have and just the experience of living in Iowa City was fantastic. Well, I think, uh, you know, I was there in the mid eighties, uh, again, admittedly at a different time than when mm -hmm. you were there. Um, uh, notice I didn't say older there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so I took my wife back there, uh, last fall for homecoming. One of my fraternity brothers, his son played on the team. And so, uh, it was interesting, the whole experience, the whole, um, tailgating and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole vibe, the airliner. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the university has changed because they have a lot more buildings there now, but right. certainly, uh, I look back on my times there, you know, in the mid eighties fondly, made a lot of good friends. Uh, and so we met several of my other fraternity brothers there and my wife said, well, you guys just picked up right where you left off. And you know, like, <laughs> how come you never talk about these guys? I said, well, it's not what, it's not what men do. Right. You know I mean? That's, that's <laughs> our knuckles still drag on the ground. It's not what we do, but certainly a great, great time. And, you know, all kidding aside, I've, it's my understanding that Iowa's law school is very, very highly regarded, very, yes. very highly ranked. Yeah. Um, but I can't say enough good things about the black and gold, and mm -hmm. especially when their football team is relevant. I really enjoy yes. that. <laughs> so you had a couple of different uh, experiences work-wise after you graduated from the University of Iowa in 2004 before you kind of, you know, f you know, before estate planning found you. Tell us about that and what was involved with that. So um, I was actually a visiting student in the last year of law school. So I went to University of Miami. Um, I was engaged at the time. And so I wanted to make the transition to Florida, to South Florida, and try to find a job there. And so um, right after law school, I was, um, I, I worked at the public defender's office in West how was your How was your experience with that? Oh, it was amazing. How it so? Was, um, again, I mean, a lot of things that happened in my life, it's, just the people. It's the people and connections that I have that really create, shape the experiences that I have. And so there was a class of 20 of us that were um, sort of like one of those law school shows that you would see on TV. We were all young, eager public defenders um, going through the same things. So we would have trials together. We would go out and we would party on the weekends and, um, we were learning a lot. And so that laid the foundation of these wonderful relationships that I still have today. Um, and so that shaped that, that piece of it. But I learned a, a lot about trial work, working with different types of people. Um, you know, I would have to go to the jails. I, I worked as a public defender in the juvenile section. And so working with, you know, children who didn't have the same experiences that I did growing up or the, the, the benefits or those the privileges that we had. Um, and that has really shaped me, especially since I have my own children. And you have three kids, right? Yes. Emma, Sophia, and Aiden. They would be really upset if I didn't mention their names specifically. Ages? <laughs> 
Um, Emma is 12, uh, Sophia is nine and Aiden is seven. I have to, uh, maybe meet them at some point. Oh, you I, will. I Don't excel, worry. <laughs> I excel at training other people's kids and then yes, I've heard. feeding them copious amounts of sugar and then giving them back to their yes. families and then exiting the premises. Um, yes. Yeah. I think, I think my brother and sister would probably echo those sentiments. <laughs> Probably a good thing they don't live here. <laughs> what what led you to go to Prime Amer- Prime America then? Um, so we knew. So we had experienced all of the hurricanes back mm. in um, 2005. Yes, yes. So it was 2005, and we knew that we wanted to. Family is very important to us, and so my parents lived here at the time. Oh, they still live here. Um, in Atlanta. And so we knew we wanted to be closer to family and we knew we wanted to have children of our own. So, you know, the free babysitters are here. So, um, no, and, and, and I do have a very close relationship with my parents. God love them. Um, but, uh, so we knew that we wanted to make Atlanta our home. And so my husband got a new job and then I had just randomly applied, not thinking that I would have the experience, but That is one thing that I learned. You never know what kind of opportunities until you try. And so this is something that I've heard from different women. I was like, oh, okay, well, like, how did you make the transition from criminal defense to, you know, I was doing securities, compliance, um, anti-money laundering, all of those things. And you know what? If you don't try, you'll never, ever know. And so it was this random application with my, you know, criminal background experience I went to the interview and I remember because I was, I went up to a funeral up in Toronto and I hadn't, I thought the interview went well. I thought it went really, really well. And he's like, you know, he was a, you know, the person who, um, was interviewing my, my boss. Um, he was saying, you know, pretty much saying I, I got the job during the interview. And then, but I hadn't heard from him in about a month. And, um, you know, of course I was a little disappointed, but I was still applying. I hadn't taken the Georgia bar, so I wasn't licensed here yet. I, I'm licensed in Florida. Um, and then, so he randomly called me while I was in Toronto and he's like, I don't want you to think that we didn't want you, um, to come on board. I just, you know, it took us a while, you know, corporations, they'd take a while to get the funding for the department. And so, um, Danny, who, who was my former boss, he's like, you know, you, you've got the job. Here it is. And, I had to learn everything from scratch. So I had no idea actually really what kind of job I was going into. Um, I, I was that advantageous looking back? Yes. How so? In terms of you never know, you need to be prepared to do anything. And Mm. so you know what that means? That means, and this is, has, is, is true in my life. Um, be prepared to and be open to learning you know, putting yourself in uncomfortable experiences. So I had to take my growth. Yeah, exactly. Of course, when I was 27, 28, you know, I wasn't thinking of that. I was just thinking, Oh, okay. Um, this is, this is just happening. Um, but I, you know, had to take my securities licenses. So I had my six, seven, all of those fancy numbers. Um, I took my insurance, uh, licenses. I really, invested in myself in terms of learning as much as I could. And I did that for about seven years. And then? And then? Estate planning found you. Yes. And then estate planning found me. And, you know, when my aunt um, got diagnosed, it was a shift um, and a, you know, an evaluation of my life at the time. Meaning what was going to bring me joy? What was going to, what could I do at the end of the day where I would feel good about helping someone? I love the people at my job. Um, they were great. It was a wonderful, um, I, you know, it was a great place to work at, but it did not give me the satisfaction that I do have today. Was it hard to leave the known? Of course. Of course. And then for me, and this is why I know planning is so important. Because when I left, I did not plan. I did not. I just thought clients were going to fall into my lap and they didn't. Um, and so I had to start a business from scratch. I started originally with two partners and that ultimately dissolved. And you know what? It was a failure. It was a failure on my part. And, and I had never experienced failure at all up until that point, like real failure, failure where I felt like, you know, I couldn't overcome it. And I learned that at that point, there was a juncture 
and and I call that like this critical point in my life where I evaluated my life and I said, okay, I could, you know, to the point where I was, you know, super upset. Um, and then I said, you know what, what can I control in my life? What can I do to make myself feel better? And then I really got into personal development. I, I, I started learning about myself, what makes me tick. I started learning about other people. Um, you know, I saw a therapist, I saw a coach and all of those things helped me become the person that I am today. And I'm a much, ask my husband, he, he will tell you I've changed significantly in the last seven years. You know, I had an old coach that used to tell me, he said, Rick, you're not as good as you think you are and you're not as bad as they say you are. You're right. somewhere in the middle. And then I had another coach that used to tell me, you really only got to do four things. You got to show up, tell the truth, pay attention and be unattached to results. And if you play enough games, you're going to win more than your fair share. And I think there's to managing everything else that's going on. I think you have to, at the end of the day, we'll be able to look in the mirror and say, Hey, did I, did I do everything I could do today? Right. And at some point that has to be enough. Yeah. And you know, what happened yesterday doesn't necessarily have to repeat itself today, good, bad, or indifferent. And, right. um, you know, I think as, as one ages, you get these experiences and I think you get more effective or hopefully more effective at putting everything in their place, um, in terms of, you know, managing this issue, managing this stress and so on. Right. And I think a lot of that has to do with how intentional are you in your day, in your life, and the goals that you set. And and that is one thing I'm trying to teach my children is, you know, try to live your life. I mean, of course, they don't necessarily understand the complexity of it, but, you know, opening up the seeds of, hey, you can be anything that you want to be, but this is how you do it. Or, you know, giving them ideas. Um, and it's just trying to shape that and being very intentional on the person I want to be to other people. Um, and in the business owner that I want to be in, in the relationships that I'm in and the people that I serve. You strike me as someone that has a lot of gratitude. Oh, I do. And I do. It, it, uh, so how did you, how did you come to that and, and, and how does that come about for you? For me, a lot of it <clears throat> has to do with when you lose, I mean, this goes, this all stems from the fact of losing my aunt who was like my mother. Um, you realize that life is fragile and that you are never, ever, and I was just having this wonderful conversation with my friend Suzanne this morning. Um, you start to appreciate the things in your life. So when you're sick, you appreciate your health. But why do we have to wait until we're sick? You know, and, and then it's also learning about yourself as well, too. Um, I started this experiment of getting up early. Last year. So I, I, I listened to the, the experiment is continuing. Yes, it is continuing. Yeah, definitely. So I listened to, uh, miracles, uh, the miracle morning. Um, and so I, I decided, okay, I'm going to get up early because I was living a life of reaction, uh, where I would get up and the kids would be waking me up, which is just does not with three children. It's just not, that's not an ideal situation. And, um, so I started getting up early. I started doing, this is my daily practice. I write 10 things that I'm grateful for, um, every day. And so now I've tried to methodically do it where I'm like, Oh, um, okay. I'm grateful for being on this show with Stone and Corey. I'm grateful for this wonderful. Well, you might want to reserve judgment on that. There's another <laughs> 30 minutes here. Right. Um, but just trying to, because when you recognize <laughs> that life is fragile, that you, today is not promised, what are the moments of the day that where I can create joy and be appreciative of that? Because I think there's a tendency and, and I'm, you know, this is an experiment for me, but, um, there's a tendency to, you know, only be grateful when you've, when you've lost something. And so to ex try to experience joy in the moments and really like, Oh, you know, the birds are tripping. And I try to teach my children this as well too. Or if the sky looks like cotton candy, we'll look up at the sky. Or did you see that cardinal today? It's those little moments that bring me so much joy. I, I think, you know, gratitude is, is really important and I think it is contagious and, it's easy to say, and I did this for a while and I realized a couple of years ago that, you know, you can, 
I, f- I used to find myself saying, well, I'll be happy when. Exactly. And then I think I realized that, you know, what if when never happens and what if it doesn't happen the way you think it will happen? And so you might just as well be happy with where things are at now. Right. And, you know, have a positive outlook even when things don't look good. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I, that really personally taught me a lot about, um, you know, what I try to do is, is thank two or three people right away, mm-hmm. uh, in the morning, whether it's, you know, via email or LinkedIn or texting. Um, and, and that has an energy that it gives off to oh, me definitely. that uh, I can take with me, uh, throughout the entire day. Right. And I think that's the great thing. I'm very expressive. So I will always be telling random strangers or just, you know, people, I love that or I love this. Um, and for a lawyer, that's very, um, different than other it's lawyers. Very out of the yeah. Box. Yeah. It's very out of the box. And so, so sometimes I find this as a compliment. Uh, most of the time, actually, I do find this as a compliment. Um, when people say, you know what? You're not like any other lawyer I, I know. <laughs> and I'm like, that is such a compliment because I want people to be able to relate to me. I, I know I'm intelligent and I know I can communicate things in a way, complex things like trusts or business planning, but in a way that somebody understands. So when they, but they also get the personal relatable side to me, which is great. Um, but you know, I appreciate that and I appreciate the, the people that are in my life. You've had some experience in terms of giving back on some boards. Uh, why don't you tell the listenership about your role there and, and how that came about? Um, so I was president of the Georgia Asian Pacific American Bar Association, which is um, a wonderful board that I, again, another God wink where I was just blessed to um get on that board. And eventually I became the president. So it was what we would call a working board. We, you know, these are partners, general counsel, um, partners of big law firms, you know, all the, you know, supposed important people. But they're important to me because of the relationships. I mean, they helped me um, in terms of like growing the organization, getting out there, um, you know, giving back to the community. And so our organization has grown over the years. I mean, we were uh, 25 years ago, you know, it was just a group of uh, 10 attorneys who started this. And when I was the president, we celebrated our 25th anniversary. We had a Southeast Regional Conference. Oh, congratulations. Well, yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. And we had a, a gala, but it's all because of the people that were involved. Um, and so that is close and near and dear to my heart. I was the first a- attorney lawyer in our family. Um, and so we share very similar experiences where we are the first lawyer in our family. We come from, um, mm. immigrants. And so that shared experience has shaped the way that we do business, um, the, the way that we interact with other people. Um, and our, our organization, even though it's geared towards Asian American attorneys in Georgia, we have a diverse, um, um, membership. So, you know, we have African American people, uh, Spanish people, everybody, you know, Caucasians. And it's great because it's the, it's the community. Community is so vital to me. It's community at church. It's community at my friends, my relationships. That, that's what I want to build and I want to model for my children. What did you learn from that experience that you, you take with you in your day to day activity today? Um, how to have hard conversations. And so, um, of course, we're a board of working lawyers. Sometimes we would disagree on how we would approach things. Really? (laughs) Um, And also how to be diplomatic and to be a leader in terms of not title, but of what I can do and how I can interact with other people. And it doesn't matter. I mean, for me, it wasn't the title. Everyone's like, oh, you're the president of Gapaba. That's wonderful. But at the end, it's what did we do to serve our membership? What did we do to serve the community? And how did we grow as an organization? I mean, and I also wanted people to feel warm and welcome because sometimes, you know, lawyer functions can be boring, but we were all about connecting and, um, one, the biggest compliment is that when somebody comes to a Gapaba event, they say, that was so fun. I got 
to really connect yeah. with other people. And it's creating those experiences for our membership um, that was important to me. Well, you do a lot of education in uh, the Atlanta area, Gwinnett. Uh, tell us, tell the listenership about that. Um, well, I, I'm on several boards. So I did Leadership Gwinnett, which is a wonderful organization. How was that? Um, it was wonderful. I mean, I had lived in Gwinnett County for the past on and off, for, you know, since 1994. So my parents were in Gwinnett County. My sister um, uh, was in Gwinnett County. And so we've seen the, the change in demographics. We've seen the changes in um, the community. And I wanted to do Leadership Gannett because I wanted to feel, you know, as a stakeholder in the sense of my children are being raised in the public schools. Um, I think it's important to give back to the community. My church is there. So how could I impact that? And so I, I decided to join Leadership Gannett and, you know, thank God I was accepted. Um, and I was, I'm able to connect with the leaders in Gwinnett. And again, it goes back to the relationships. Um, when my sister was going through a medical issue, I was able to call my colleagues and now my dear friends when I needed help, you know, with a hospital question or um, just different, you know, I was able to call on hospital administrators to get their expertise and, you know, transferring my sister from um, Savannah to Atlanta. And the ability to have that relationship with the leaders in community was so impactful. And I, I mean, just amazing in terms of like appreciating that relationship. How do you go about getting your clients now? For me, again, it's relationships. It's building a relationship with a financial advisor or a CPA or other leaders in the community. And, um, I don't do any real SEO or, you know, Facebook ads, it's, it's really creating, um, relationships with people. What's the most challenging thing about what you do with your business? Um, in terms of clients or what do you mean? Anything, anything and, that comes to mind that's challenging with your business. Okay. So my business is growing right now. So it's finding the right people to fill the spots, but also in terms of creating an excellent experience. I can't remember the book, but so, um, the CEO of, uh, the Ritz Carlton, I was, it's, you know, the journey of excellence. Like I can't remember it, but so my word for the year is excellence. And so it's like excellence, not perfection, because I think a lot of women, I, I hang out with wonderful, amazing, successful women who just sometimes they're very hard on themselves. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had this issue as well too, until, I'll, you know, and I still have this, I'll still struggle with this, but you know, you want to be the perfect mother. You want to be the perfect attorney. You want to be the perfect businesswoman. And sometimes you'll never achieve perfection. You can only strive for excellence. And for me, it's, you know, it, what, in what ways can I be excellent? Um, and so sometimes it's the stress of wanting to deliver perfection, but really I'm trying to strive for excellence. And I want everyone, all of my clients to experience that excellence. But, you know, that doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey. Yeah. And it evolves. Yeah, it, it certainly is a journey. There is an evolution. I think there's one word that that uh, I certainly use and that we use um, in our offices, and that's intentional. Right. What is the outcome you're trying to drive? Right. What are you going to do every day? You know, what's the goal at the end of 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? And what activities are you going to, you know, execute and harness to try to get there? Mm -hmm. But every interaction that you have, you can give something to somebody, you know, and, and I've read countless articles about folks that, you know, you don't, you just never know when something you say to someone is going to make their day. Oh, yeah. You never know. If someone is struggling and if you smile at them and say something kind, you know, how it could impact their day. And I, I, I do believe that. I didn't always believe it, but I, I certainly do now. Oh, I, I agree with that philosophy because when I was doing corporate work, when I was in house, there was no need, you know, I pretty much did the grind. You know, I would <clears throat> drop off the kids at daycare or, um, then I would, you know, just go to work, do my work. 
but there was no intention behind that. There was no intention of living purposefully because I didn't have to. And so when I became an entrepreneur, I had to learn that. I had to structure my day. So how can I bring joy in my day? And so it's, you know, going back to living intentionally and it, it's, it, it can be challenging at times, but the more intentionally I live, the amazing people I attract into my life. How do you structure your day and how did you arrive at uh, how you structure your day? And, and is there any sort of evolution that you could tell us about? I, okay. <laughs> I'm an excessive planner right now. So when I was in corporate, I would always use um, a regular planner. And so I'd plan my day that way. But when I became an entrepreneur, I had completely unstructured days. So it was non-productive. And I didn't realize it. Um, and then now I use high, I don't know if you've ever heard of Brendan Bouchard, but he's this motivational speaker and he has this uh, agenda. It's called the high performance planner. And I use that religiously. I bring it in the car with me wherever I go. I, um, I plan out with my husband, Justin. Um, we spend probably a week, an hour on Sundays going over everything, trying to manage, you know, okay, what do we have here? What do we have in terms of business? What do we have in terms of goals that we want to accomplish with our children? What activities there are? Um, when are we going to church? When are we? I mean, if you look at my house, I mean, people always make fun of me, but I have calendars all over the house with different color coded systems. Um, but because I live intentionally and I structure my days that way, it gives me more time. So when I say, okay, I'm going to be done by 530 today, I am done by 530 today because, you know, I've built in the time to do my billing or I've built in the time to, um, call back my clients or to do the things that I need to do to have a successful business. Discipline sets you free. Yes, it does. Of course, that's a transition. It's an evolution. Um, and it's hard initially to, to start that process because you're like, oh, no, it's okay. I'll just get to it. And I was always of the procrastinator um, mindset. Um, and then, you know, that transitioned. And I, I mean, I, I have what you would call entrepreneurial ADD. Where I'd be like, oh, shiny object, shiny object, you know, and squirrel. then, yeah, exactly, squirrel. And, and I tend to, because I love working with entrepreneurs and small business owners, they have that tendency too. But I've learned that by just, you know, by trying to have self discipline, it's, it's easier that way. When you're not helping your clients or giving back to your community, what, what sort of activities uh, get your free time? Any free time that you might have, you throw the qualifier in there. <laughs> um, I love to travel and I love to eat. So, um, it's, it's traveling. It's having the experiences with my children, whether it's going out, walking up Stone Mountain, volunteering at the food bank. Um, the experiences where I feel like I'm giving back or I'm at one with nature. I really enjoy that. Um, we went to go visit our friends up in Blue Ridge and the kids learned how to kayak. And I was like, Oh, kayaking is fun. And I never, so I, there's always this conception of, well, you know, I've never done that before, you know, so why should I do that now? Or just let the kids experience it. But when I push myself out of my comfort zone and I actually do it, it's an experience that I can enjoy with the children. So now our goal is if we, you know, do certain things. Oh, okay. You know, we'll buy a kayak for the family. Never thought I'd be a kayak person. What other things do you like? Uh, does your husband work? Yes. What does he do? Yeah. <laughs> he does fire protection engineering. So he works for a national fire protection engineering firm. Um, he's wonderful. He's super supportive. We've been together forever. But as I was talking to him this morning, um, we've evolved a lot as a couple. Um, you know, and he was there for me when I was at my very lows, very supportive. Um, but we've evolved as a couple. And so now we're trying to do things intentionally. So whether it's like I'm waking him up at four o'clock in the morning to journal, to walk, to pray the rosary, you know, all of these things. But it's it's helped us in our relationship to connect with one another, because the only time we really have to connect is really at four o'clock in the morning. Because the kids get up at 630 and it's just craziness at that point. Best time of the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I know you're an early riser too. 
What's the most satisfying thing that you do on a day-to-day basis in your business? Um, it goes back to the connection and making a, an, an impact on my clients' lives. Um, you know, whether or not, you know, so people, some of the people, some of my clients, they will call me when they're at their very low. Um, you know, if, if somebody's, you know, their father has been diagnosed with cancer and I'm helping them through that difficult process, um, that brings, you know, of course it's a difficult process, but I've experienced it. Um, and whatever joy I can bring to them or relief or, um, you know, that, that, that just feeds my soul. Yeah, I, I totally get that from you. I mean, you know, being relatable, intentional, you have the discipline. Uh, and I know you shared your personal experience with the listenership about getting into estate planning, but was there, was there any other jumping off points that led you to become an entrepreneur? Um, just that. And then, you know, the joy that I would feel when I would connect with other entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, um, and small business owners, they have this attitude and this energy about them that is contagious where we will sit with other entrepreneurs entrepreneurs and whether it, it doesn't matter whether or not they've been in business for 25 years or one year or you know um, they're just starting out there's this energy um, about them that is so contagious where you you know you're brainstorming ideas you're thinking about things um, and the entrepreneurs that I surround myself with are always in uh, asking what can I do for you mm. what can I do for you the how right, can I the help? right ones are right right and so um, I've been lucky enough and you know blessed enough to surround myself and, and of course this has been a process with people who bring joy to my life, but who also raise the bar for me. Um, you know, very successful entrepreneurs, very successful professional women that have been my mentors and that have been, um, just around me. And I'm so blessed to be around them. And, you know, the, the, even without saying certain things, the, the behavior that they're able to model, um, and they're impacting me in ways that they don't even know. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, unselfish is probably another word that I would throw in there. I think it is, uh, from where I sit, it's very, um, it, it's just great to be able to tell somebody, uh, give somebody advice to help them business development wise, to be able to say to them, Hey, I, I tried this. Uh, it didn't work. Here's why it didn't work, but here are some things that did work for me. And here's why I think they worked and it might fit for you. It may not. Right. Um, and I think as you go on, I mean, you build this, you build these, uh, uh, this, uh, Rolodex of high end people that can help out, that will follow up, that will be relatable, that will help the clients and not back them into a corner. And, you know, certainly Stone is one of those people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he's been extremely uh, helpful in terms of relationships and, and building, but there's, you know, probably 20 or 25 others that would make that list you included. And I think there's, there's an energy, there's an unselfishness, and then there's, Hey, you know, how, how can I help you? And they're not necessarily thinking about helping themselves. Although, you know, at some point I think when somebody helps me, I think, Oh, how can I help this person? And right. What's, right. You know, it, it heightens the urgency to, uh, help them out. Right. And it's that contagious energy that's generated when you're with like-minded wonderful, forward thinking people who just share and who are givers. Um, and you know, I think like attracts like. And so when you raise a level for yourself, you attract that, that abundance. You know, you've been invited on the show, uh, because you are successful. You've been favorably introduced by a former guest. There's a lot of things that, that set you apart. I think we've outlined discipline being relatable, um, intentional. What else sets you apart in your business? I, I think my need and my quest for creating an efficient and excellent customer experience. I go to these conferences. I learn about myself. I learn about processes 
um, and educate myself so that I can create that excellent customer experience for um, my clients. Many of my clients, like I would say 95% of my clients are busy entrepreneurs or very successful professionals. They don't want to think. They have to think about everything else. And if I can streamline or bring them a process that's easy, then I will. And if I have to research it and refine my processes so they don't have to think about it, then I will do that. And I do do that um, in terms of learning about what's the best technology out there or, um, you know, what is the best way that we can co- effectively communicate and also, you know, refining my communication skills. What does that mean? You know, are they a visual learner or are they, do they need a checklist? Um, and so really understanding human nature, developing it and then applying it to a process. I think that's, I love doing stuff like that. I, people think I'm crazy, but, um, but I love doing that because it brings all facets of psychology, but also efficiency. Well, I think it's helpful to, uh, to be around like-minded people that think out of the box that are uh, intentional, that have discipline, that are givers. I think you, you are true. Um, you know, like attracts like. And, uh, on that issue, I think, you know, as I go on, uh, I think one of the first things that I look at is, you know, if I like the person and if I don't like the person, it's just, just a non-starter. I can't, I can't do it. And I am physically <laughs> incapable of that. And, you know, that is well, what it Corey, is. Corey, I'm glad you like and, me. <laughs> and I think, um, well, I don't like you, Stone. I don't know why, I don't know why you're laughing. Um, you know, cause if I don't like them, I don't have any interest in getting to know them. And if I don't know them, I'm certainly not going to trust them. Right. So, you know, there's uh, like no trust, but I think, one of the things that's important uh, in building relationships with people is being able to say, hey, I, I just need you to do this and you need to tell me what I need to do. Right. I mean, I know that I've got a really good client when they say, look, I trust you. Right. I want you to just handle this for me. What do I got to do to make to get this done? Right. And I think, you know, I think about, you know, going to my CPA. I've known Ben for 20 years. Mm-hmm. He knows what to do. He knows. Uh, and I just say, here's all my stuff. You tell me, you know, where it fits in because I trust him. Right. And I think, you know, when I go to the lady that cuts my hair, I've been going to her for years and she'll say, we're going to do the same thing. <laughs> yep. And then we talk about, you know, goings on and current events. So I think that the trust and the familiarity and just being able to go and not think, I think one of the you know, my, my nephew, um, is, uh, is very good with his hands and he, he builds things. And so mm-hmm. like, I really enjoy it when he hires me in so many words to come over and do strong body, weak mind jobs. Okay. You know, like he'll say, I got to tear out these cabinets oh, or okay. I got to tear up the deck or I got to have you move these logs or, you know, this firewood. And I, it's great because I, I, it's brainless and I don't have to think. Right. And, um, you know, cause he's the one that is going to be, you know, doing the building. So I, I totally get that, that mm-hmm. people that are high flyers and that, you know, are working and applying themselves for 50 to 60 hours a week don't, don't want to think right. after a certain point. And I think people, if you have the right relationship, they just want to trust somebody and go, Hey, you, you got to tell me what I got to do here. Right. I don't, I don't know what to do. That's why I'm here talking to you. Right. And, and to rely on your expertise, um, and, and to turn to you for resources. So one thing that I've done with my clients and my community is whenever there's an issue, um, I, you know, clients will call me up for anything, house cleaners, realtors, they are, you know, solve my problem. And, and I love to do that. I love to be, um, a giver, the, the quarterback. Yes, the quarterback. And then to solve other people's problems. If I can lighten your load, it brings me joy. hundred percent. Well, you've, you've certainly been a tremendous guest and I wanted to ask you if, if there were some advice you could give the younger version of you, what would it be 15, 20 years ago? Take chances. Don't be afraid. In, in, in my twenties, I was fearful and not live your life with fear that, you know what? Um, everything is, you know, you can figure it out. If there were a young lady that wanted to follow in your footsteps, what would your insight and what would your words be to that person? Look at yourself and, and really 
evaluate yourself, and then learn about yourself. The more you learn about who you are, what makes you tick, what makes you angry, what makes you happy, the better off you will be in all aspects of your life. Well, Cherish, you've been a great guest. We, we, you know, congratulations on all of your successes. Uh, you know, I certainly have great respect for how you conduct yourself, how you get out there. Um, if the listenership wanted to get a hold of you, how would they do it? Do you have a website? Yes. So it's www.delacruz, D-E-L-A-C-R-U-Z, dash law.com. Is there an email address or a phone number that they might call to set up a meeting with you to uh, help be a benefactor of your expertise? Yes. So um, 678-922-1532. And then you can personally email me at Cherish. It's like the song, C-H-E-R-I-S-H at delacruz-law.com. Continue success. Thank you for being such a great guest on the show, and, and we wish you nothing but the best going forward. Thanks, Cherish. Thank you, Corey, for having me on here. Thank you, Stone.